What's up, everyone? UFC Fight Night Columbus Blades versus Dawkus. It's Geek. It's Marley. It's an unbeaten main event pick streak on the line. Let's break it down. All right. All right. We are back. And Big Marley looking svelte, looking good in the Army swag. What's up, my man? Hey, not too much. Uh, still undefeated on 2022 on main event picks. I feel pretty good about keeping that streak alive this week. Guess you'll have to stick in to see who I'm picking. Uh, but I think it's a decent card, uh, but it's almost a little too straightforward for DraftKings. So I'm kind of worried on how we're going to get different here. Hoping you can maybe put a couple ideas in my head, but uh, let's get to it. I got to tell you, a uh, weird card for me because outside of a few fights, there's a lot of stinkers. And it almost seems like from, from a fantasy perspective, not from a <clears throat> fight perspective, although from a fight perspective too, but there's some definite, definite fights here that look like they're going to score low. And I think we're going to need a couple of low scorers. Like, all right, here's my prediction, Big Marley, that the winning lineup this week will have one and maybe two, but definitely one score in the 80s. Yeah, I could see that. I think there's a lot of fights on the card that, that are real close and that could be low scorers. Uh, but then there's just two blatant chalk plays that I want to eat all of, and that's what's going to make me be so similar to the field here. Um, Good lock button. Lock button. Yeah. And, uh, and we'll figure it out after that. I think that's how it's going to go. But the anticipation builds. What are the lock button fights? Let's find out. We're going to start at the bottom of the card, work our way to the top, break down every fight, fantasy, betting angles, whatever we can figure out. Let's get into this. And first up, we have got Luis Saldana taking on Bruno Souza. Pretty much a pick em fight at this point, minus 117, minus 103. Um, and this fight is one of the aforementioned DraftKings potential stinkers, in my opinion. The uh, fight goes to decision prop is sitting at minus 195. So two to one odds that this one goes to decision. I think, uh, you know, I like the fight goes to decision bad. I, I like those odds. Actually, I think it's even higher likelihood to go to decision than those numbers imply. But Big Marley, how do you see this one going down? Yeah, I usually like my curtain jerkers, but not so much on this one. I just think this is going to be one of the slowest paced fights on the card because of Souza's style, just his karate style, where he's looking to move around the cage, avoid the contact. And Saldan is not a high-paced guy himself, and he fades late, so he's just going to slow down as the fight moves along. But I do expect it to be Saldana being the guy that brings the fight, pushing forward, uh, throwing the heavier shots. He's more likely to get a knockout, more likely to get a submission here. Uh, but the odds have shifted to Souza being the slight favorite at minus 120, uh, with him priced as the underdog on DraftKings, I think that his ownership will now just be just too high to want any of him. Uh, I was a little bit interested in him just because he was a live dog. But now with the, the line shift, I think he could get like 15 more or 20% here, and that's too much for me. So I'm X and Souza out here. Even if he wins, I would expect it to be a close decision. Maybe he scores 50, 60 points, something like that. It could be a, a real stinker. Um, but on, on the opposite way with Saldana being now the underdog, but priced as a favorite, I expect his ownership to go down. And I do think he's the one that's more likely to finish this fight. So I'm okay with some Saldana exposure, especially if I'm doing, you know, using the domination station, making 150, I'll get some Saldana there where I won't have any Souza, but with my hand builds, I'm probably staying away from Saldana as well, because I have this fight going to a decision. I pick Saldana to win a split decision here just because I expect him to be the guy with the octagon control if it goes there. Uh, but yeah, overall, fight to fade, but Saldana or pass. Yeah, I mean, normally when we're dealing with fev featherweights, you know, this is a really exciting division in MMA, but, the you know, it's usually high action fighters. There's usually some grappling. In this case, no grappling expected at all. Both of these guys just like to stand and bang, and they are not high volume strikers. It's really... You know, I don't see either guy going very far in the UFC or in this division. I think this is a fade for drafting. The only way it's going to get there is an early finish. It's super unlikely. Um, I'm with you, though. If you had to go with one, I guess Saldana. But for me, this is pretty fadeable on 
DraftKings, and I have no interest in betting it. It's just a hard fight to call. There's nothing. The only bet I would be interested in here maybe was fight goes to fight goes the distance because these just these guys just aren't finishers and they haven't been. But in general, no, I'm not betting that either. So this is this is pretty fadeable for me. The only way either guy ends up in the winning lineup is pretty much with a first or second round finish. The volume's too low. How are you going to be 145 pounds, Bruno Souza? Not a wrestler. And you only land three strikes per minute. Like, it doesn't compute. Not going to win like that. That's karate style. It does not pay the bills for DFS. It's, he, for a karate striker, he's absorbing a shitload of strikes, though. Like, he's absorbing five strikes per minute. Usually, the karate guys don't get hit at all. Like, they're good at that. Bagdasari is dangerous, though. And I think he's a legit prospect whereas Saldana is not quite as dangerous or as good here so yeah I feel like this one go if he can survive a Bagdasarian uh on slot then I think he can survive a Saldana yeah. here so and, go through and, a decision I don't really care who wins at that point on DraftKings because they probably put up like 65 or less points th there we go and and you know for for you guys sitting out there whenever you hear quote unquote karate style if you need to translate that is that's not going to score well Okay, that style just that's Wonder Boy, that's Leona Machida. These are guys who just don't throw a lot of strikes. That's you know, that's what they do. Yeah, they'll get a knockout every now and then and score well, but if they don't, they're not scoring. What do you think Daniel Son would have scored in that uh victory over uh Johnny Lawrence back in the day? Well, what round, was round that? that was a late one, right? Very few strikes landed before the yeah, you know the third not round finish. The got the knockdowns, he's got the knockdown points though. Um <laughs> 80 points for 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 uh karate kit. He was the underdog though, so maybe that is the optimal, I guess. He might have made the optical in the All Valley Championship uh uh DFS event. All right. Next up, you know, this is a tricky one to pronounce. I'm not going to lie. So Eliaschab Kizriyev taking on Dennis Tuiluilin. Lin. Okay? Sorry. I have not heard these names enough times. To, Big Marl, I mean, what a, you know, how do these guys pronounce? Um, how do you pronounce this last name? I don't know. I've, I've been calling it Kizraev versus Dennis. Oh, you cheater. <laughs> I'm not good with the pronunciations. Dennis. I'll even sometimes like make sure I listen to the announcer so I can get it, and then I'll lose it like an hour later. But how, how was that again? So I just don't even worry about yeah. it anymore. Yeah, all right. Well, tricky one, but... I believe this is one of the aforementioned all-in fights. DraftKings finally added this to their um, fight card. They, I, like yesterday, last night, uh, it took Brett aptly hitting them up on Twitter to remind them there's an extra fight uh, on this card that they've left out. So um, Kizraev is a minus 510 favorite with uh, Dennis at plus 405. This looks like an all-in fight. Because let's take a look at the finished prop, and we have a minus five fifty ends in the listen. This is a card without many high high scoring fights. It's very obvious. So Kizrayev, Big Marley, he's like a great, you know, he's got the name. He's a relentless grappler. Is he Dagestani? Maybe I don't know. But you know, he's he's from that style. Like uh, you giving Dennis the the uh, the menace here uh, much of a shot. No, not really, and I don't even know where those odds are. I'm showing closer to minus 1,000 across the board on this guy. Um, and, I mean, I don't see any value there, but it makes sense. I, this is kind of a, a squash match to me, whereas this Kiz, this Kizraev guy, he's, he's aggressive early, and I feel like he could even be the better striker here. Maybe he could get the early knockout on the feet, but that's really all that this Dennis guy is going to offer is a striking exchange. And if he's going to be on the optimal lineup, it's going to be a first round knockout. Just he, he he knocks this guy out. We haven't seen it before yet. Uh, he gets lucky. But if he doesn't do that, I just don't think he has any shot at winning here. Uh, once this fight hits the ground, I expect Kizrayev to dominate. And I do think he looks for takedowns early in this fight. Probably doesn't need a whole lot of time thereafter. Can get a ground and pound uh, finish or a submission here. He is minus, what is it? Minus 310 inside the distance. He's minus 125 to win in round one. Uh, yeah, he's a lock button play for me. Uh, I'll probably be close to, if not all in. I don't, I don't know that I'm going to make 150 lineups this week, but if I do, I might still just lock button him in because he's there. There's just two plays on this the slate. I want all the leverage to, and they're going to be super high on. So like the lock button is the only way I could do that. Yeah. And then hopefully I can get different in my other four combinations, but this is the first one. 
And I, I want all the Kizrayev, and I want none of this Dennis guy. I just don't think he is UFC material where Kizrayev probably is. And this is like his fifth attempt at making his UFC debut. Uh, hopefully it actually goes through this time, but I expect him to dominate, finish in round one. Score of 100, over 100 points. Yeah, Tui Louie Louie. Um, when you look, you know, sometimes you got to wiki cap this, okay? And I just want to point out that the records of the, his wins have come against, and, and I'm just going to point out, all right, his wins, two and five guy, five and three in a shitty, uh, you know, Russian promotion, zero and zero guy, zero and 11, zero, zero. Like this guy's wins, seven and nine. He has one win over... Uh, like a, an opponent with in, at, at least somewhat okay. Right? And look at this fat ass that he beat. I mean, come on. So, come on. So, this is just ridiculous. All right. Kizrayev is an actual prospect. And the other guy is, is a tomato can in here to get his ass whipped. It's very simple. They don't overthink it. Lock button. The only reason you wouldn't lock button Kizrayev is if you want to go some crazy game theory, you know, and, and they also underpriced him at 9,300. Technically he's underpriced. He's priced below Marion Fierro. Yeah. Really? That doesn't make sense. That, okay, that's, I mean, that's what made it almost an all in play for yeah. me. But if you want to get different, it's strictly for ownership purposes. Yes. So that's it. Just, just, you know, game theory ownership nonsense, but I'm lock buttoning uh, him and one other fighter. Uh, I'll be, I'll be lock buttoning another fight. I don't know if I'm going to do the fighter himself. We'll get to that one. I don't want to ruin it. All right, next up we have, and, and a lot of these are going to be rough fights for, for scoring. This is one of, to me, this is one of the roughest fights to pick a winner as well. David Dvorak, Matthias Nikolaou, it's really close. Dvorak, minus 137. Comeback on Nikolaou is plus 117. Um, these are smaller fighters. Big Marley, man, it's really close. How do you see this one going down? Yeah, it is really close. Both guys are well-rounded. They can fight anywhere here, but I give Dvorak the slight edge on the feet and then Nikolau the slight edge on the ground. If we go to a decision, I don't think either one of them is going to score well, um, but I would think that maybe Nikolau is the more likely to end up on the optimal if this guy does go to a decision because he probably lands a couple takedowns, has some minutes in top control, and he's the underdog. So just a, a live underdog here, but if he does win, I really don't expect more than 10x unless he gets a submission here. Dvorak has never been submitted. Um, and I think Dvorak's more likely to get a knockout on the feet than Nikolau is to get a submission on the ground. Nikolau's been knocked out twice. Dvorak's got some uh, some solid standing, some solid striking. And I think he can keep this fight standing for the most part. So I picked him like a split decision type of fight. I just think this is the closest fight, maybe second closest fight on the card looking forward to it just from a you know a fan perspective it should be a fun one but i don't expect a big draft king score here i'm okay putting either side of my lineup uh for like mme purposes I'll, I'll mix them in but when i'm hand building i just don't really see this fight ending up like in my single entry at all i think they're both in play for cash games if you need to go there but i would favor nicolau and cash games and i think i'll say dvorak and gpps you know i think matthias nicolau actually has a lot of potential but this dude needs to use his grappling a little bit more than he does. It's it's very good. It's pretty slick when he does choose to use it. But I mean, you can't the fight against Elliot, for example, that was way too close for comfort. Like you're sweating your balls off uh, if you bet Nikolau in that fight. Elliot almost won it, um, and and he had such an advantage. He just wasn't using it. So I don't know if I'm going to question his fight IQ or whatnot. But with Dvorak being a slightly better striker, I would hope that Nikolau might use so i'm gonna favor nicolau just because of that reason particularly for a DraftKings play i think nicolau has an escape route if Div if dvorak is kind of whooping him up on the feet he can use his wrestling um and his, his really his top game which isn't 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 terrible unfortunately it's not elite so it's not bettable either for me i, I think if he does it and he pulls it off great but i'm not i don't think we can count on him holding his opponent down for two full rounds or kind of doing enough even to win a decision there. So for me, this is pretty much a pass, but for, for DraftKings purposes, I'm going to lean Nicolau primarily just because he does have a path that involves a little bit of a better scoring than Dvorak standing there landing, you know, four strikes per minute over five rounds and getting you a 72 point, um, 
decision win. All right. Next fight, Big Marley. Man, it's 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 more of the same, bro. You, you're not gonna be able to fade every fight here. It's more of the same. Um, you got Chris Gutierrez taking on uh Dana Bagatelle, aka Danny Bagels. Um man, Bagatelle, bro. This dude has been knocking people out out here looking like like Debo. That's my back punk. That's what that's what Bagertel says after he knocks somebody out. That's my back punk. Like, who is this little little man who's knocking out all of his opponents? What's going on here? What is happening? And he's taking on Chris Gutierrez, the leg kick specialist, the decision specialist, Big Marley. He only wins decisions, except that one time when he got a leg kick knockout and scored massively when I faded his ass. So, I don't know. Here's my thing, and I want to hear your breakdown technical. But all I'm going to say is this, and this is just, this is not technical. It's just one of these things. I usually find that guys coming off of like three consecutive finishes, the way that Bagartel is, they tend to be overvalued a little bit, both on the books, on the lines, all of that. Like it just looks good. So I think I, I got a little, just a straight sort of betting tingles. I don't like it when guys are coming. I mean, I hate to penalize that, but I just think you get overvalued. It's like when a team in football has this big win against a great opponent. All of a sudden, we think the Titans are like the greatest team because they beat the Bills, and then they just lose game after game after game in a row. So um, that's kind of uh, – that's my my take. But how do you see this one going down, Big Marty? Yeah, this is one where – I mean, I kind of favor Gutierrez here. I, I think that – his leg kicks, first of all, will slow Bacharel down as the fight moves along. But Bacharel's, well, his way to the optimal lineup is going to be an early finish no matter what. But I just think if he doesn't get that early finish, this this fight's going to start moving into Gutierrez's favor here. So I do think he makes sense on DraftKings, Bacharel that is, uh, because he's plus 150 inside the distance. If this fight ends in round one, it's likely him getting a knockout. He, he's only 8,500 on DraftKings. That's probably on the optimal lineup. However, if he doesn't get that knockout in round one, I just think Gutierrez wins this fight. Uh, I don't expect a big score from Gutierrez. I don't see him getting a finish, but I think he wins rounds two and rounds three here, if not even all three rounds. Um, just with his movement, I think that's going to slow down the pace from Bat Jarrell and make it harder to knock him out here. So if this fight goes to a decision, I, I favor Gutierrez a decent amount here. Um, he's an underdog on picking the win. So I think he's in play for that reason, but he's going to need to be one of those guys that you're talking about who scores 80 points and ends up on the optimal lineup. That might work that. this week. Big Marley. That it might work. I don't think he's an 80 point scorer though. He's a 68 er <laughs> Yeah. I mean, somewhere in between there. Yeah. Um, I, I'm not going to make it a priority to put him in lineups, but he is an underdog that I will have in my player pool, uh, where I'm going to be underweight on this bad drill. Most likely. Yeah. I, I there, so there are two bets that I like in this fight. One is fight goes to decision. I just think it's going to decision. I think the the number is skewed because, again, Bagatelle, and, and listen, it burned me last time against Brandon Davis, no doubt. That burned me. Like, I did not play uh, Danny Bagels. That 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 sucked. But um, fight goes the distance with these two guys at, at minus 110. That, that to, that's a bet for me. I like it. The other thing is I like Gutierrez to win the fight. Gutierrez has never been finished. He's got a lot of fights in his career. Doesn't mean he can't be. Doesn't mean he can't be. Just means he's never been finished before. He's been, or I'm sorry, I don't want to say finished. Not deliver wrong information. He's never been knocked out. He's lost via submission. And Gutierrez's kryptonite is getting taken down and getting wrestled. He's, his wrestling game is pretty bad. But Danny Bagels, he doesn't wrestle. At all. Neither of these guys do. So this is going to be stand-up striking. You're going to see um, Bagartel, if he can't, I, I agree with you, Big Marley. If he doesn't get the early finish, his, his leg is going to get chopped up, going to be hopping around there, you know, in round two, not looking as good. And you know what? Give me, I, I love it. It's an underdog play. You could take Gutierrez. He's bettable, I think, as an underdog. I'll take the plus money. I'll take the money on, on the fight goes to decision if you don't want to make a decision there. I think fight goes decision is a better bet because you get sort of all of that combined. And for DraftKings purposes, you probably have to have some Danny Bagels in case he gets the finish. But, how you know, in case he does it again. But I'd be in the 10% range. How about you? 
yeah, with my hand builds, I'm going to probably avoid him, but I'll, I'll let the DS control it for MME. Yeah. And I'll make sure that he's not more than 15%. I'll probably max it on that. Yeah. I, I want to be below the field on um, Bagartel because again, he's coming off that, you know, multiple first round finishes. And I, I just, that just doesn't hold up. That just doesn't hold up. I'd rather bet against it than uh, bet on it happening again. All right, here we go. Next up, we got Sarah McMahon, plus 180, taking on Carol Hosa at minus 220. I don't know about inside the distance odds. I don't even think it really matters in this fight. It ain't happening. This fight probably going. Uh, actually, no, inside the distance is, is in play because Sarah does like to get herself gassed and knocked out late in fights. So uh, inside the distance, whoa, wait a minute. Oh, I'm on the wrong one. Hold on a second. I was like, wait a second. No way. Here we go. Fight goes the distance, minus 160. That sounds about right. Inside the distance, plus 130. So that's a that's pretty decent inside the distance prop there, Big Marley. How do you see this one going down stylistically? Yeah, I kind of like this fight for DraftKings. Uh, I'm picking Rosa to win here. But McMahon, if she wins this fight, she's got a good chance at the optimal lineup. She could get a first-round finish here, break the slate. That would be a first-round submission, by the way. Because uh, she's one of the best wrestlers we've seen in WMMA. And I think she could have an early edge in this fight if she's able to land takedowns here. But either way, if she's able to go into a decision and win two at least two rounds, it's going to be through grappling. So she could still put up over 10x. I would expect over 10x if McMahon wins this fight. Um, but I don't expect her to have any sort of edge after round one here if she even has a, an edge in round one. I think Rose is pretty darn good. I think she's a much better striker here. And the longer this fight goes, the more it's going to get be in Rosa's favor. I'm picking Rosa to win this fight in round two or round three, and I think those are both good props to play um, because I expect McMahon to just maybe have success in round one, and if she doesn't, she's just going to quit on herself. Uh, she's over 40 years old at this point, uh, and if the wrestling's not going her way, she's a great hammer but a terrible nail type person, um, and I think Rosa could be you know, the hammer in this one. So give me Rosa. And I think she can put up a good score here. But if this goes to a decision, uh, it might be tough for her to score well, especially if she gives up round one, spending a lot of time on her back. So I don't think she's a must play. I'd rather pay up for, for our two favorite fighters. But I, I'm going to be mixing her in. And then same with McMahon. I'll probably let the DS control her. But on my hand builds, I'd rather play the underdogs that I'm picking to win because I picked a handful of underdogs on this card. So I'm going to just gravitate towards them rather than the higher ceiling of McMahon in a win, just because I don't think that win is very likely. It's not even that high of a ceiling. If we're being honest with ourselves, you know, this girl yeah. does not throw strikes and, and she doesn't really do that much on the ground. She can get the takedown. She can get control time, but you're right. She is going to get lit up on the feet when the striking exchanges happen. You know, Sarah McMahon has never landed more than like 40 or 50 strikes in a fight. She does not throw strikes. So it's all about the grappling and on the feet. Hosa, Hosa, my girl is a volume machine. I love Carol Hosa. She has been making me DraftKings money every time, winning decisions, 180 strikes. Like this girl, I love it. I don't think that's coming here because I do think McMahon is going to hold her down for at least round one. And that's the issue. McMahon does come out hot. She's got a little energy in the first round and she is a good grappler. And Hosa can be taken down and she will be. I think it's going to happen. But when when that attempt happens and she can't get the takedown, like in round two when she's tired, or Rosa gets up and then McMahon kind of like gives up a little bit, she's going to get lit up on the feet. So I agree with you. I think McMahon is playable, but I really don't expect her to get the win. I think she's going to look good in the first round. And this is a good live betting situation too. You might want to just wait and just live. When McMahon is looking good in round one, and and having control time, maybe that's the time to live bet it when you might be getting like closer to even odds. I don't want to bet it here, but uh, this is a live bet situation in my opinion. Yeah, I put that in my breakdown as well. Oh, there we go. Noise. Uh, yeah, I love it. So um, with that being said, this one, uh, yeah, as much as I might want to play Carol Rosa a little bit for that second, third round finish, I don't think with the double lock button play up top that we're going to have an easy time squeezing that one in. But um, I also don't think she's going to score. I just want to point out, like, it's important to note these things. You know, Rosa has scored really well um, for the most part, 110 and in decisions. 
This is what I was talking about. And she does have takedowns. She's just really good. She's a good fighter. I love her potential. So uh, 8,900, it's just a price point situation where, man, you, you almost have to forego, you know, the Dagestani or our other all in play. I don't want to say who it is. And we'll ruin the, the suspense um, to play her. And it's going to be tricky to really uh, pull off. So next up, and I'm hoping this is one of the spots where you've picked an underdog, Bing Marley. I think it might be. Maybe, but we've got, uh, you know, Vicky Slav Boroshev taking on Mar Mark Diakasey. Okay. Boroshev is a minus 160 favorite and the comeback on Diakasey is plus 140. Uh, fight goes to decision minus 195. Pretty good. Pretty good. So big Marley. Did I did I guess right? Yeah, nice. yeah, you did. And I feel like you opened your page like on Monday or something, and you haven't refreshed it since because I'm seeing like plus one forties for DKC. And I no, don't I mean I'm anywhere. on this, man. I just low. This is the number right now. Maybe it's changing. Let's see. What are you seeing? I don't think there's oh, yeah, a plus right. one forty anywhere. By the way, I didn't do that, but I just hit refresh, <laughs> and they did all just change. So what? I don't know what the hell that was about. Fightodds.io. I don't know what you guys are up to, but. I did just all right. So wait. Yeah, there we go. All right, we yeah, are, are we looking minus one thousands on Kizrayev. Yeah, now we're up to date. Of course, now the order all changed in the <laughs> fight, so it just really messed me up in a different <laughs> way, where I'm now going to have to figure out <laughs> the order of these things. But um, Dia Casey, oh, that, there it is. Yeah. Wait, it switched back. What is going on with your page? But yeah, I, I mean, I would take plus one forty on Dia Casey. I think, I mean, Slava, what I'm gonna call him. Uh, great striker, one of the best strikers in the division. If this was just a pure striking match, I mean, I'm picking over him over most UFC guys in that. But that's all he is. He's just a, a pure striker. I mean, he's been taken down twice in the first round in both of his fights so far on the Contender Series and in the UFC against guys who I would think are, are less of wrestlers than Diakisi. Diakisi is mostly a striker himself. I think he could even get a knockout on the feet here. I just don't think he wins very many minutes, especially early in this fight on the feet. But that's where he should be looking to be a wrestler is early in this fight. You can land takedowns, slow down Slava as the fight moves along. Um, and I mean, if you can get takedowns, start working your ground and pound. I think if Slava gives up his back, Diakisi can choke him out. He's not really a submission artist, but I think he could choke him out. I think he could get a ground and pound knockout. Uh, and if this fight goes to a decision, only one of these guys has a chance at the optimal lineup, and that's going to be Diakisi. Uh, Slava's definitely in play because he's a dangerous striker, plus 120 inside the distance. Um, if, but we're going to need that knockout for him to be on the optimal lineup. So I'd rather, I'd, I'm probably going to be like in line with the field, but I would rather go underweight than overweight on him. Whereas Dia is going to be an underdog who, who might be my favorite underdog on the card. Actually. I like him in all formats. I'm picking him to win maybe all three rounds here. If not, uh, then I think it'll be rounds two and round three, uh, go Dia Kisi. Yeah. I, I, you know, good guess on my part. Cause I agree. I like Dia Casey here. I don't really get why um Barshev is the favorite i mean i get he's been winning some fights against some low-level competition dia casey is really a tough fighter to put my finger on he looks like he's got all this potential but he does definitely have a hard time putting it together he looks like different guys in different fights so it's kind of weird he's kind of weird fighter but he has takedowns he has grappling the other guy doesn't the other guy doesn't have any takedown defense. He's easy to take down. This one isn't easy. Play the underdog. And I agree. Dia Casey is one of my favorite underdogs on this car. I don't, I don't even need to go into it. He's, you know, two takedowns, almost three for 15. I think that's what he's going to do. And that's the path. He can grapple this guy and probably squeak out a decision. And Dia Casey is also a big striker. He can be, but I just haven't seen it that much since he's been in the UFC, but I, I feel like the potential is there when you watch him. Yeah. Some Slava of got fight, rocked by Dakota Bush and Dia Kisi is a much better striker, more powerful than yeah. Bush. It would That's not what, shock, shock me to see a Dia Kisi first round knockout, to be honest. And so this feels like a little bit, maybe an overhyped prospect that maybe is getting a little more interest than he should. All right, let's move on. This is a fight that I really like here. And, and I'm going to go to a different odd screen because the other one just keeps reverting back to some weird shit. I don't know what's going on here, but Neil Magny 
taking on Max Griffin. Magni now minus 275. This line has moved quite a bit from the open, um, where I think Magni came uh, open at minus 220-ish. Of course, that didn't just open, so I can't see it. FICO's decision minus 200. This does look like a decision fight. And um, Big Marley, man, betting against Neil Magny when he's not taking on a top five guy has not been a successful approach in DFS, in betting, in anything. Are you going to buck the trend here and go with Max Payne? No, uh, no, I'm not. I do think <clears throat> Max Payne is the better DraftKings play of the two just because he's the underdog here. But I think it's a good matchup for Magni. I see this fight being a decision fight. <clears throat> and I just think Magni's better everywhere. I think at, at range, he's the better striker. I think he can get in the clinch win there. And I think he can hunt for takedowns and win this fight on the ground also. With Griffin, I would really just give him... I mean, I would give him a chance in a striking match. I think it could be real close if it's just a 15-minute striking match, but I would give him the knockout edge here. So if there's a knockout in this fight, I would expect it to be Griffin. He'd be he'd probably be on the optimal lineup if that happens. But if he wins the decision, I really wouldn't expect much more than 10x if he even gets there. And with Magny, I really don't think he even gets to 10x, and I am picking him to win a decision here. So I'm probably going to... Hand build wise, anyways, I'm going to fade Magny. I don't know if I completely X him out of my player pool, but I would just rather pay up for our, our two favorite. And then there's just other people on this card I would rather get. So, um, you know, bet wise, I'd rather have Magny in a parlay. But if I have to use one of these guys on DraftKings, I'd rather just take the shot on Griffin because he allows us to pay up for those guys that we do want in our lineup. Yeah. Uh, so he's probably going to be the guy that's more exposure in my lineups. But I'm fine just fading the fight and hoping that Magny wins. Um, a clear but low scoring decision. Yeah, it's just the way it's the way the numbers go down this week. Magni has scored well occasionally in wins. Um, he definitely has grappling in his repertoire. Um, and he's used it on occasion, but he's also he is really up and down with the type of scores he puts up. We've seen, yeah, I, I mean, I'll give the example in his last win against Jeff Neal, who I think is a perfectly identical to Max Griffin fight. It's like the same guy, you know, 72 pointer. He's got the 63 pointer in there. His best wins, lots of grappling, 100 points. So there's nothing that Neil Magny does where you're like, oh, no, at 8,800, I need to to roster him. I do think he's going to win, though. I did bet um, Neil Magny when the when the line was minus 220. So he is part of a couple of parlays that I put together for this card. Of course, I did that like last week. and the line has moved. So I feel like those bets were pretty good, but I don't think I'd bet it here at minus 275. I liked it at minus 215 and 220. So I'm going to stick with that. I think he's going to win, but that we don't need him in our DraftKings lineups. Uh, and, and Griffin, I just, I don't think Magny's not that easy to knock. I, I don't think he's getting there. He, I don't think he's getting there. Magny will tie you up. He'll slow you down. He'll take you down. He'll hold you down for a while. You're just not able to land a hundred plus strikes in a fight. I, I I don't see Griffin scoring well. He could get a, you know, a, a fluky knockout or something. But beyond that, I don't see it. All right. Next up, we've got the Boa Constrictors back. Alexi Alinik taking on Elir Latifi, aka Lats. Alinik is a plus one seventy five underdog, and the Boa Constrictor it. Oh no. Sorry. Boa Constrictor is a plus 175 underdog with Latifi as a minus 210 favorite. Now, Big Marley, we know what Olenek does. He wants to submit you. He's the Boa Constrictor. But I got to tell you something. I think Olenek might be better on the feet than Latifi. Like, I don't know. I'm not impressed with Latifi's his volume. I, I just don't like Latifi at all, man. This is one of the lowest... DraftKings scoring fighters in the history of DraftKings in wins. I've never seen anything so terrible. This guy gets a 45 in a win, bro. He like lands 22 strikes. How are you going to play? How are you going to play Latifi, even if you think he's going to win? Yeah, he needs a knockout, whether that's on the feet or a ground and pound knockout. Um, and I mean, I, I, I was going to pick Latifi to win when he was aligned at minus 145, but just money's been keep coming in on him. And now he's minus 210. This is an underdog or pass for me now. I just think Olenek is the much more dangerous guy on the ground. I don't know if you want to take him down because that's really all 
Latifi has at this point is just some some wrestling. He doesn't do anything on the feet. The last uh, two fights, he went to decision in both those fights. So that's 30 minutes of fight time, and he landed 15 significant strikes combined. Like, that's pathetic. Um, he can get some ground strikes here, but it won't be – you're not going to be working a whole lot with, with Olenek under you. So it's got to be something big that knocks him out or else he doesn't score high enough. So I'm, I'm more so on the fade Latifi side here. I think Olenek can submit him. I think he could win a striking match here. I think he could even maybe get a knockout. I doubt he gets a knockout. He throws some mean overhands, and he get he gasses a lot uh, as the fight moves along. But I'm picking Olenek because the line talked me into it. Uh, I think he could get a submission here in the first or second round, get a really high score. So I'm interested in him. But I just don't feel good about a 44 year old guy at this point. So I don't want to get too much exposure. But for me, it's dog or pass um, in all formats and betting DFS everything. Give me Olenek here. Uh, I think he can get one more win, and then that's probably it for him. I, you know, am I being fooled by the fact that Latifi doesn't really have a neck at all? And I'm kind of like, can you even choke a guy like this out? I'm not sure. Yeah, I mean, yeah, I've heard that on like every podcast. But if you, if you look at their pictures, Latifi has more of a neck than Olenek, <laughs> to be honest with he's you. He's just one of those, you know, he's got, he's got those gigantic. Yeah, uh, and I don't know that you even need to get, you know, it doesn't have to be a choke. I think one of my least favorite things in MMA is like ankle locks or, or something like that, because you could be dominating the fight. And this guy who's on his back just grabs your ankle and the fight's over. Like I've lost too many times to that. So I just hate him at this point, but I could see Olenek just doing that where uh, he grabs a knee and Latifi doesn't know how to get out of it. And that that's it. Yeah. These guys are both old. I, I, I agree. I think Latifi will absolutely put himself in position to be submitted. I think he will put his head down. He will push into Olenek. He will not stand. Olenek has much longer reach. He's a larger man. It's very rare for Alexei Olenek to be the larger fighter. I don't think he's got any less left in the tank than Latifi. So, you know, kind of look at these two guys. I'm with you, man. I think it's dog or pass. Elite Latifi, can he get a knockout? Sure. I mean, he's fighting a 44-year-old man, and he's a large man, and he could throw a punch, and he'd touch the spot. And you go to sleep. That can happen. Of course. You got to play the old guys a little bit. You got to play them. Because every once in a while, you know, like like I said, Olenek looks good. And then he just gets tired and boom, just goes to sleep. Yeah, I mean, even completely gassed in like the third round of his last fight, he landed 24 significant strikes in one gassed round. That's more than Latifi did in 30 minutes. So that's just pathetic on the Latifi side. Yeah, I can never get behind that as a favorite, as a big favorite, especially. Uh, so I'll be definitely rooting for Olenek here. I don't know if I if I trust him enough to put him in like a single entry, but he's in the mix with all the other underdogs that I like to win here, and I think he has a higher ceiling than a guy like Chris Gutierrez, who I'm picking to win. No, I like it. I like it a lot. Um, all right, moving on. We've got Manon Fierro, major prospect, taking on Jennifer Maya. Fierro is a minus four seventy five favorite, the well second largest favorite on the card at this point, with. Maya coming back at plus 350. Oh, fight goes to decision, minus 195. Fiero has been a finisher, Big Marley. She looks great, but she's also taking, she's been taking on pretty low level or mediocre um, opponents, I would say. Uh, Maya is a step up for her. So you think she could get that fast finish and burn all of the people who are kind of leaning on some of these other favorites in this card? Um, I mean, not really. I, I I do think this is the test to see really how good she is, but I think she's the, the real deal. We'll be fighting for titles. Um, I think she has a huge edge on the feet here where I expect the majority of the fight to play out. I would worry about her off her back here. I think Maya could not only just get takedowns and hold top control, but she could possibly get a submission as well. Um, I just don't expect her to be able to land more than one or two takedowns in this whole fight. And I don't think that'll be enough because I think she gets lit up on the feet. I just don't think she gets lit up enough on the feet to get finished. And with Fioro being $9,400, I mean, yeah, I'm definitely, I'd rather pay down for the, the two people priced below her, but so will the whole field. <clears throat> but at the same time, she's a big favorite, and I think she'll still get a good amount of ownership here. So for me, I think the best play here is just to fade the fight. Um, I think Fioro is a, a solid cash game play. I would use her there. Uh, but in GPPs, I'm going to try and get away from this fight and hope that she wins with the 80 point decision here. Cause that's kind of how I see it going down. It's just not, she's priced too high. I think for the optimal lineup, unless she can make it along with the other two fighters. Um, 
but then you're really dumpster diving for your for your other three. So uh, I'm going to try and get away from her, but at the same time, I feel pretty good about her winning. Totally agree. I, I think she's going to win the fight. I think she could probably score 90 points in a win. The question is, is 90 points in a win going to be enough? I, I think that will actually be one of the high, the top six scores on the card. But the way the math works, I do think both of the fighters that are priced just below her will outscore that. And so the way the math works, you just it, you play all three. It, it's right. You're playing a bunch of seven, seven K, 71 or 7200 types, and you better pick winners. And these two better ma this one better massively outscore every other one. So so for me, I just won't have I, like I think it's appropriate that the field is not going to be high on her because it's just not a good spot. Maya is tough. My her opponent is not a bad fighter at all. She's a tough chick. One around she could Maya could win rounds here. She could get a takedown of her own. Fioro has fought some of the worst of the worst. So to me, we don't really know how good she is yet. I agree with you. She's a prospect, but uh, no way I'm paying 9400 on a card like this for that type of a fighter who's likely to win and get us about 90 fantasy points. It's not enough. It's not enough for me. Um, so that side is a pass. And, and I don't think Maya wins. So I'm not really... There are other female fighters or or even if Maya did win, she's winning a 68 to 72 point decision anyway. So I think I can do I can, I think I can get those points from someone else. So yeah, fade it. All right, next up. Let me go to the, the, the correct odds screen here. Here we go. All right, next up, we have got Asker Askarov taking on Kaikara France. Now that line is just still flying towards Asker Askarov, who is a grappler, I would say, primarily. And he's taking on Kaikara France, France, who's primarily a striker. Kaikara France, not a guy you've been making money on if you're fading him, particularly if you've been fading him as an underdog. And so we get that situation again. How do you see this one going down, Big Marley? I think this one's closer than the line does. Um, I think Askarov is a big favorite because he's a title contender. He's a well-rounded fighter. He can strike and he can get takedowns, solid grappler as well. But his edge in this fight is going to be on the ground. I think uh, people really see France as a weak ground game fighter. He has a number of losses on, on his record from submissions and just being taken down. But he's never been taken down more than once in a UFC fight. Askarov's not the – I mean, he's a good wrestler, but what the like 28% takedown accuracy, I believe it is, something like that, which isn't great. Uh, but I think he can land multiple takedowns in this fight. But on the feet, I give France the edge. I think not only is he the better striker, I think he'll be higher volume. I think he's more likely to finish. Um, so I'm picking France on this one. I think it's a split decision type Ooh. of fight where he is taken down, you know, two or three times in the fight, but it's just not enough to really sway the judges. And I think like it's going to come down to the card. It's going to be like this judge scores the fight 29, 28, da, da, da. This could judge scores the fight. And I, you're really going to rather hold the underdog ticket. Uh, if that's the scenario, I could be wrong, but I just think this fight is, is a really close one. And I'm going to take France for that reason. Uh, I mean, if it was a pick em fight on the line, then I would have taken Askarov. So the line is, you know, making me have that final decision, but I do think it's a pretty close fight. And I see France having a, a decent amount of success on the feet and possibly even knocking Askarov out and getting on the optimal lineup. So for me, it's going to be more so France or pass. I won't X Askarov out of my player pool, but I just don't see me getting much of him. I would rather target. I would, I would rather have Fioro to be honest with you, because she might even be lower on than him. I'm not sure. I have them real close to each other, uh, but Ideally, I'm fading both of them, and I, I want some France exposure. Yeah, I like it. I really like that call, Big Marley. Um, you know, Kaikara France has elite takedown defense, 87%. He's really, really good in that regard, and he has fought guys who who go for takedowns and won. So it's not one of those fake numbers. He's always known to be a striker, and if he could stop the take, and and what I'm seeing here, and what you're you're agreeing with is the takedown accuracy of Askarov, which is kind of a let's call it a commentary on his offensive wrestling skills he's a great grappler we know it but 28 percent isn't the best i really like this is a really interesting fight on FanDuel where you do get points for stuffed takedowns kaikara france could stuff eight takedowns in a fight like this and really just blow up that FanDuel score that's a cool 
DraftKings should did adopt. They still do that? I heard that they didn't have that in the school. I don't play any Fanduel, so I don't really know. I, I haven't, haven't played Fanduel in a bit. Uh, yeah, did they I don't know if that, that's a stat anymore for it. I'm not sure. Oh boy. <laughs> so look into that before you go. Yeah, let me double check that one because <laughs> I, I don't play much on Fanduel, but that is that one stat that I always think about. Like, oh, that's interesting for Fanduel when you get a guy who can stop a bunch. I, th- I think it's a good stat, by the way. I think they should use it, and DraftKings yeah. should adopt it Different, too. Different, yeah. Yeah, it's it's unique. And I think someone beautiful. told me that. Uh, so I didn't see it with my own eyes. I was just hearing oh, from well, else. Somebody, you know, we'll have to double check that. But overall, yeah, I love your call on Kaikar France here. I'm not playing Askarov really. He could get four takedowns and still only score 85 fantasy points in the style of fight. His his he's going to be the less effective striker. France France, he's good. Like he's got he's a good striker. So um, and he he throws with volume. He's got good striking defense. Everything about and I said it at the beginning, you, you really don't, he's not been the guy when he's an underdog, especially you're not making money betting against Kaikara France. Like he finds a way to win the decision. He's not going to score as a, as a favorite. I never play him because I don't expect him to score a hundred plus, but as an underdog, he's a really good fantasy play. And on this card, especially where it's going to be, listen, we just need winners. Like the, it's a lot of low scoring fights. So if you find a, a cheaper winner on a card like this, you're probably giving yourself a significant edge. So uh, I, I like to call big Marley and I'm going to, I'm going to tell you on that one and go with France as well. All right. This is a fight I'm looking forward to. I know a lot of people kind of poo poo it. I like it. I like it. Pick them fight. Matt Brown versus Brian Bam Bam Barbarina. Minus 110, minus 110. It's a pick em. And I, you know, I could definitely see a finish happening here. Minus 225 doesn't go to decision, Big Marley. You know, these are two kind of like semi-broken fighters, I would say, especially Bam Bam. He, I think he took like an ass whooping once from, uh, man, who was it? Was it Vincente Luque? Yeah, he took, yeah, three rounds of a ton of strikes. That was a fun yeah. fight. I, I feel like he hasn't been the same since, you know, the durability hasn't been there and Matt Brown's just getting older, but you know, he's still got that toughness. He got that elbow and I don't know. It's a tough fight to call, but how do you see this one going down? Yeah. I mean, super close. Like the line indicates, um, Barbarine is not really looking that great. I mean, everyone's saying that he's on some huge decline. I, I've always said that he was overrated, and now you're seeing the real guy. But at the same point, I mean, he had he had like back surgery or something like that. He was out for a while. So it makes sense that he would be on a decline. But he's much younger here. Um, he, he's a durable fighter. He's a high pace striker. He's got decent cardio. So the longer this fight goes, I would think that it starts shifting into his favor. But Matt Brown's, I think, the more technical striker, the more powerful striker. I think he's more likely to get takedowns here. Um, so I just see it being a real close fight where Barbarina probably leads on volume. Uh, Brown might be landing the harder shots, has a couple takedowns along the way. And maybe uh, in another state, Barbarina gets that nod. But this fight's in Columbus, and Matt Brown is the hometown guy there. I actually I got t- front row tickets from Dana White when the fight when they had uh, UFC – Cincinnati fights, um, hit up Dana in the DMs, uh, and Ooh. he ended up hooking me up. Uh, You're kidding. And it, yeah, it was front row. Like, Wait, Dana Dana White answered your DMs? Yeah, yeah. I'll, I'll hit him up every now and then in the DMs. But that was the one time I actually asked for some tickets, not expecting to get anything. And I actually didn't hear back from him like up until the fight, so I was getting worried about it. So I DMed Anik, uh, like at weigh-ins. And I was like, hey, if you get any chance to ask Dana, he said he's going to hook me up with some tickets, uh, but I haven't had them yet. And then next thing you know, after weigh-ins, I got a DM from Dana again saying, uh, you'll get a call tonight or something like that. Um, but yeah, That's front awesome. row, was it was awesome. But the crowd went crazy for Matt Brown. So I think that's the extra edge here. I mean, the crowd is going to go nuts every time this guy's landing a fight. Whereas if Barbarina's doing anything, it's going to be silent. And these judges aren't even fucking watching fights. They don't know what they're doing. So I'd rather have the Matt Brown side in this one in Columbus, Ohio. Um, I saw like, what was it? Plus 500, plus 600 by decision. I, I've been thinking about that the last day. I, I'm probably going to end up playing that um, in he's Ohio. Gonna, Give me Matt gonna, Brown in a close gonna fight. He's going to knock this guy out, dude. He's I don't gonna, see him knocking him out, but yeah, I think that's in play, and that's how that's how he makes the optimal lineup for DraftKings. I mean, they're they're the mid range fight of the week. I think it will be high paced. 
either guy could be on the optimal. I'm cool mixing them both in. But yeah, for single entry, I'd rather rather have the brown side. But I don't think we have to play this fight. We might see a 70 point score from the winner. Uh, again, I I, I kind of think a 70 pointer might get you there in one fight in the middle or 75 er. But yeah, I mean, what I would say is do not not count on. I would not count on like him getting an elbow finish here. Bam Bam is just going to, he's going to stand there. He's not very good. You're right. His best quality has been durability early in his career. It, it goes back to what you said. Even when you broke down his fights, you're like, he doesn't look that good to me, but sometimes he just out durables his opponent. They, they, they start to tire. And he, in earlier days, he would like gain strength during the fight and skill where the opponent was tiring. I think that's gone for, for Barbarina or it has been the last few fights. He, the durability hasn't looked as good. And, you know, beyond that, he just doesn't have that much going on. You can't really, you know, he's taken some losses that are, like, really bad um, recently, especially the one to wit. So, um, yeah, give me Matt Brown here. I, I like Matt Brown. I think he get a second-round finish in this one. Like, I could see him getting it in the second round there and being in the nuts. So I definitely want exposure to Matt Brown. I think Matt Brown is much more likely to finish the fight than Barbarina is. Barbarina could get there too. You got to have exposure to both sides, but I'm picking Brown as well. I'm with you. I love the crowd noise factor. Hadn't considered it at all. But yeah, I mean, him being from Cincinnati and and this fight taking place in, you know, Ohio, they are going to be going nuts for this fellow. And I think they're the same age in, in fight years. In like body wear and tear, you know what I mean? I don't know about that. I mean, Matt Brown died before, right? So I think not only is he legitimately older, he's probably got more wear and tear, more just life wear and tear. Yeah, but Bam Bam's got some wear and tear too. The the, the back yeah, issue. Yeah, back surgery's not good. Yeah, yeah. So I, I don't. I'm like I'm not differentiating that much that way. So give me Brown in this one as well. I'm with you. All right, not too much disagreement on this kill shot. Not too much at all. Let's see if maybe this next fight will stir up a little controversy. Alexa Grasso, minus 235, taking on Joanna jo Joanna Wood at plus 195. Actually, let me make sure those numbers haven't changed. Yeah, there we go. Alexa Grasso at minus 250, taking on Joanne Wood at plus 200, Big Marley. And this looks like a fight that will go to decision. Minus 280 is the prop there. So how do you see this one going down? Yeah, I expect a fun, high-paced striking match. Um, and I expect a close fight here. I mean, I would slightly favor Grasso in this matchup, but she's over 70% on the betting line. I think, I think she's closer to like 60% maybe. So this is dog or pass for me everywhere. The betting line, DFS, cash games, GPPs, all of that. Uh, Grasso's at 9K on DraftKings. That's just too much for me. I mean, she scored um, her highest DraftKings scores, 92 points against Carolina, where she, she landed 163 total strikes. And let's not uh, forget that Carolina is a complete, complete yeah. can. Like, shell of her former self, anyways. Yeah, this is not... I think she's living off of that fight a little bit. Like, you beat the, the shell of Carol K. She hasn't given a shit for four or five years already. She's just been going for paychecks. Yeah. And I mean, even if I do expect a high paced fight here, but even if she does that same exact performance and scores 92 points, that's still probably not enough at nine K. So I'm probably going to full fade Grasso here. And then on the other side with wood, formerly known as Calderwood, she is a high paced striker as well. It's going to be more so her kicks versus Grasso's boxing, but wood is more likely to land takedowns here. Either could get a submission, but I don't expect that. I think we get 15 minutes of action in a very close fight. And Wood has never scored less than 89 points in a win. She averages, I believe, 114 points in her DraftKings wins. She's probably 7,200 here. I think she's a lock in cash games. I want to be overweight in GPPs because I'm picking her to win. Um, I, I think it's a, a split decision type fight, and I, I just would rather have the underdog ticket on that. Um, and I do think if she wins, she is scoring more than 10x, whereas – I don't think Grasso is if she gets the W. I love it. I literally love this breakdown because I have the same thought. When I when I looked at this fight, I said, "This is definitely this is exactly the kind of fight where like you have to be a pretty big donkey to bet Grasso. I don't care if she wins or loses. What is she doing that's going to look that much better than JoJo? To where you're going to have this massive confidence? She's a lower volume striker." 
you will not have any confidence. It's a split decision looking fight from the beginning. It doesn't make sense to me. The line, I don't get it. Even now, I don't get it. Jojo has had a couple fights where she had some personal shit going on. She didn't look that great. But for the most part, when she's been on her game, I don't see her as a worse fighter than Grasso. As a matter of fact, this is like a 50-50 fight. I think about the same. About the same. Yeah. I mean, Wood gets... <clears throat> the judges hate Wood. I mean, maybe it's just because she kicks a lot. I don't know what it is, but she's she lost that, a lot she of fights where Irish she should have won that. Man. And I feel like that's why people are betting Grasso. They're like, this is going to be a really close fight, but the judges are going to give it to Grasso. And I, I would never pay you know, a 71-plus percent line for that type of outcome. Yeah. Like, you want a pretty clear win, and that's... I just don't see that here. Jo Jojo's got that pale British person skin that like you get hit a couple times. It's just red blotches everywhere. She just looks like she's getting beaten up in there. You know what I'm saying? Um, Grasso, not so much of that. I don't know. But but like the 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 Irish kind of like the fighters that have that really kind of like that type of skin that really gets. Listen, I get marked up too, bro. I get marked up. Couple shots. Fucking black and blue judge is like he's getting his ass kicked in there man get him out that's what jojo looks like but uh so fine but come on you can't bet grasso here they're the same person jojo throws for higher volume they're both female fighters gonna stand there it's gonna go to decision and you're gonna be you're gonna be you're gonna be like oh shit biting your nails last week we had a judge score a fight 30 to 27 for a girl who was getting her ass beat for three rounds straight This the last thing you want to do is trust the judges here. So I totally agree. I love the wood call. I think she's a great play in cash. She's going to land volume. Even if she loses, you're probably looking at, what, 75, 85 strikes landed. I love her in the strikes landed props on super draft and underdog. Did, wait, is that your underdog play? Strike yeah, landed? I actually got her at like 75 and a half. And now I think that's up like 85 and a half. That's maybe. Big Marley put that shit out there before I got to it. <laughs> Yeah, um, I did her, and there was another one. Um, Matt Brown over forty-two and a half strikes. So, okay, so I only have the two plays. Um, okay, your that's counting on the decision because he ain't landing forty-two strikes. Uh, probably it's going to take two full rounds for him to get there. I think. Yeah, I expect the decision, so I think he lands. Yeah, up. I like it. I like it. But really good props. I love it. Take the take the striking props. Definitely for JoJo, whatever they are now. Barley messed it up for everybody. Put the fucking bet out there. Everybody bet it. Drove the number up. She told me first. Yeah, I mean, I I, I kind of expect over a hundred strikes here from her, so I would still play it. But it's definitely it's kind of like McMahon last. I feel like McMahon lost last week, because, and it's like right there now. It's eighty five and a half. I just feel like that's real close. Like you could be biting your nails at the end, hoping for one or two more strikes to get yeah. it. But um, Jojo's getting there. I love She's my line seventy five and a half. So if you can find that on, I only play underdog, so I don't know what prize picks or super draft is, but. It, if it's under 80, I would smash it. I will be surfing the other prop sites for that specific prop as well. And we get to the main event of the evening. Did I skip one? No. All right. This is the next all-in fight of the of the card. Curtis Blades taking on Chris Dawkins. Blades at this point is getting ridiculous. Minus 475. Again, I wish this thing came up quicker. But you'll see that the number has been moving in favor of Blades. I do have a parlay with Blades and Magni already made. Did it on Monday. Seemed like an easy one. I think I got Blades at a much cheaper price. We'll see if this ever loads up so I can see what that number was. But I want you to tell me, Big Marley, why this is an all-in fight and how you're expecting it both to go down from a stylistic perspective and also from a fantasy scoring perspective. So, yeah, I mean, it's a pretty easy one for me, and it's similar to all of Blades' fights. He's the best wrestler in this division. And, I mean, I really think for almost anybody other than my new favorite prospect, I mean, my new favorite heavyweight in Aspinall, um, I'm picking Blades over really everyone in this division because of his wrestling. Um, his issue is that he he's a good striker too. I think he would win a pure striking match here, but his he's got a questionable chin here, and that's his path to victory. Is I mean that's Dawkins's path to victory here is getting the knockout. If he doesn't get the knockout, he's not going to have a 25 minute striking match where he can maybe get three rounds on the scorecards. 
Blades is going to be racking up takedowns. He, he averages over six takedowns per 15 minutes, and he has 25 to work with in this fight. He only landed three takedowns in his last fight against Rosenstruck. That's all he needed, just one takedown each round, and you're going to win it. That's kind of all Blades has to do. I don't know that Dawkins can get uh, Blades off of him, and he's not throwing up triangles to, to submit Blades off his back. So I just expect a mauling here from Blades. He only scored 85 in that last fight against Rosenstruck, but now he's got two extra rounds to work with. So I just don't know how he wins this fight and doesn't score over 10x and most likely over 100 points. So um, he, he doesn't have to be an all-in play because he could get knocked out here. But yeah, this is an all-in fight. It's either Blades mauls him or he gets knocked out and Dawkins scores highly from that. I would, I'm, I mean, I would think at least 80% Blades for me. 80-20 sounds, sounds all right, but I'm fine with 85-15 to be yeah. honest with you. Um, he's my... Oh, shit, he might be my favorite fight on the fighter on the card. I could see him outscoring Kizraev. It's just that I would rather have a little Dawkins rather than the Dennis guy. So, um, yeah, Blades, Kizraev, lock him in cash games. Get as much as you can in GPPs. If I'm making 20 or less lineups, I'm just locking them both in, hoping that I can get the other four combinations right, maybe leave some salary on the table, something like that. But that's probably going to be uh, what I do this week is just focus on these two guys, put them in every lineup that I hand build and then get different elsewhere. I love that you said the 85-15. I literally wrote it out in my notes. I was like, listen, Blades is pretty much an all-in play, but he has one path to a loss. One path, and that's it. And every other version of, of his win scores 120-plus points. That's the beautiful thing about Curtis Blades. Like the His win scores 120-plus. Locked in to the nuts, especially on this kind of card. His one path to a loss delivers a nuts victory for his opponent, and that would be with uh, a Dawkins finish at some point. Blades gets knocked out. He just does. He's got questionable um, chin. And, and and I do think that he's he's a little bit gun shy because of that nasty Derek Lewis. That was the one that really like changed. That was a life changer. He, he didn't even know where he was when he woke up from that one. He was like, did I win? And he didn't win. He didn't win. So how do you treat this for DraftKings? Exactly as you said. Basically, it's an all-in fight. One of these two guys is in the nuts lineup on this one. Dawkins gets there because he gets a finish in the first or second round. And Blades gets there because even if he doesn't get an early finish, it's just going to be takedown after takedown. And it just gets better. He gets better as the fight wears on, not worse. Like, you're fine if it goes to decision. It gets even better for you. You're looking at, like, nine takedowns, 10, 50 points alone from that. Uh, control time is crazy. The longer this fight goes, actually, the better it almost might be for Curtis Blades. So it's the all-in fight of all-in fights. you got to make a decision how much you want to do. Um, if, you, if you're just using implied probabilities, plus 475 for Curtis Blades, you'd fear about 10%. 10%. That's fine. He's not winning any other way. If there was a prop that said, you know, any other result. Yeah, there it is. Blade, that, wait, Dawkins... Here we go. Let me show this. All right. Dawkins wins by finish. Not Dawkins. And he said. Uh, Dawkins by KO. Oh, they don't give it to you. All right. They don't give it to you. But I mean. Dawkins is either winning by KO or he's not winning. That's it. Blaze is a better striker. I think he's the grappler. It's one. It's one or the other. So there we go. Load up on this fight. Easy, easy, all in for me. And to recap, Big Marley, if you're let, let me just show this on screen. And, and like, this is how your lineup start every time, guys. Like, this isn't too difficult. You're going to go blades. You're going to put in. Where the hell is that? Yeah, Kizraev. Okay. We're going to go blades. We're going to go Kizraev. And then what, right? Maybe throw a little JoJo in there for some salary relief. Now we're at 8K. So th this is kind of like how lineups will start. And then you're going to either, for the last three spots, if you want to get a... Yeah, that's, that's how my cash lineup would start right there. For yeah, sure. Oh, for sure. I mean, there's no stack necessary. You know, and then from here, you're going to kind of make some choices. You want to take Matt Brown for the big win. You want to go Olenek, you know, Olenek Brown. You could do like Olenek Brown, all finishers. You know, and you got an 8,500 spot left, so you're going to be forced to choose a turd. I think almost every lineup that you make, Big Marley, is going to have one fighter that you feel shitty about. Yeah, that's how I've only got my single entry that I've been working on, but I hate it because of that 
that feeling. There's no I I've I have done the numbers, right? I've done this a bit, and it's really tricky. It's really tricky. Here's one, here's a version where you might get away from a turd, but you have three underdogs. It's not it almost every lineup is gonna have somebody in this zone of not that good. Yeah, and plus you're similar to so many other lineups too, because yeah. it'll all be pretty popular. You can play Dvorak, you gotta play Nikolau, you gotta play Saldana. You're gonna have to play one of these, which is why I keep saying I really do expect like an a sub 80 pointer in the winning lineup. But I mean, this is it. So, you know, everybody's got the same set of circumstances. There is there are not six fighters that look like they're gonna score well on this card. So you're gonna have a turd in there. Pick pick underdogs that actually win, and then you're probably gonna be in good shape. All right. Big Marley, kill shot. Kill shot going uh Joanne Wood. Split decision scores uh 93 points. I like Kaikara France. I love Jojo Wood. I'm I'm leaving it for you. I knew you want. I love Jojo Wood. I'm gonna go Kaikara France. I think he can win the fight. I love that call. I don't think he will be high owned at all. And you don't want to fade Kaikara France. He's not that guy when he's an underdog. You don't want him. So give me France. You take wood. We already went through the whole thing, who we like. That'll do it for the kill shot. Of course, Big Marley, Geek, we'll be back next week. If you want to get the rest of our picks, official bets, all of that stuff, make sure you sign up at DFSArmy.com, promo code sleeveless. And before you go, let us know what your kill shot is. Drop a comment. Drop, drop it in the comment section below. Let us know who you think the kill shot is on this card. Who's that fighter that people aren't going to be on that's going to be in the winning lineup that you kind of overlooked? I could have gone with Matt Brown, by the way. France makes more a lot more sense than Wood because Wood will be pretty chalky. But yeah, I, I feel I, pretty I, good about her. Yeah, I, I I don't know if she's going to be chalky. I, I don't. I really don't know. I, I just think no one's going to want to play her opponent. I hope she's chalky because that lets, in the sense of like, it tells me the field knows what they're doing because I think that that line is crazy. So. All right, that'll do it for the Kill Shot MMA podcast. For Big Marley, for Geek, we'll see you guys next time. Deuces. Deuces.